Okay, everyone. Welcome back to the final little chapter of our conference here. Yeah, all right. Um, I want to thank uh, Court, if you guys haven't met him, um, out there at the table with Fibonacci Saponier. Uh, he's making a special shampoo for float tanks. Um, so if you haven't talked to him about that, uh, you definitely should, because that's pretty interesting and awesome. Um, next up for you guys, we have Fred Colley, a uh, Portland local here who is a, um, an expert microbiologist who um, has been kind enough to kind of uh, study up on some of the things that um, we as an industry are interested in, like hydrogen peroxide and those type of things, um, and is here to give you a presentation. And we've also built in a good amount of time for um, a lot of questions from you guys, because I know it's a real just big, hazy area for all of us in the float tank industry with so little to go on and so little to look towards for resources on that sort of thing. Um, uh, I don't believe he's done a lot of dealings with the health department specifically, so any like questions about bureaucracy and that kind of uh, process is probably not going to be um, exactly what we're hoping to address here. More just like actual questions about um, the, the chemistry of water and sanitation. Um, so I will pass it off to Fred. Thank you. Um. Well, it's been a very interesting weekend, and uh, thank you, Ashkan, for inviting me. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my own background to kind of orient you. Um, uh, in 1969, I had just finished an NIH postdoctoral uh, fellowship at uh, Louisiana State University Medical School in tropical medicine. And, uh, I was uh, hired by the University of California Medical School in San Francisco, and uh, they sent me to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where I did research on malaria <coughs> and uh, uh, other parasitic uh, organisms, uh, mostly in animals from the tropical rainforest. And uh, the, the 60s, a lot of you are too young to remember, uh, but I certainly remember vividly, was a time of uh, uh, great cultural change. Uh, there were a lot of things going on. Uh, the Vietnam War was raging. Uh, the women's movement was just getting started. Uh, civil rights, uh, the assassinations. But there was also positive things. That we had the Beatles and so forth. And uh, all you need is love. So uh, uh, that was the time that uh, I left the country and went overseas. And uh, I had already gotten interested in some things uh, uh, like yoga, I took uh, BKS's uh, uh, classic uh, book, uh, Light on Yoga, with me. Iyengar had come to this country in, I think it was 1964 or 5, and, and taught yoga uh, at the Ann Arbor YMCA. And uh, so I was interested in, in, in yoga and had started to practice it. And also, uh, when I went to Malaysia, I took uh, John Lilly's book, The Center of the Cyclone. And I read that, it was very fascinating. But the thing that impressed me the most about Lilly was that uh, his, his attitude toward research. Uh, he had been doing research on dolphins, and he came to the conclusion that dolphins were so highly evolved that it was unethical to, to do research on them anymore. And he said, if you're going to do research, do it on yourself. And that was when he developed the uh, sensory isolation tank. Uh, so uh, I came back to the United States. Uh, in 75, came up to Oregon. Uh, uh, after a few years, got a job at uh, Western States Chiropractic College, and I taught uh, clinical microbiology, public health, and a few other things there for the next 25 years. So I'm semi-retired now, but I'm uh, still uh, working for an environmental laboratory as the uh, uh, director of their microbiology department. So I've had lots of experience with uh, inspections from uh, Oregon State and uh, with OSHA, and uh, believe me, those inspections are not easy. They last for two or three days. They have people come in and go through all the records and so on and so forth. So I can, uh, I know a bit about that. And uh, so uh, here, 40 years have passed, and all of a sudden I get a call from Ashcon, and uh, he wants to know if I'd be interested in coming and speaking to to you at this conference. So I remembered Lily's work and. I uh, went down and talked to him. I liked his setup, and so I agreed to come. And uh, I don't know how, uh, how much of what I say will be relevant to you, but 
it's late in the afternoon, at least maybe I can entertain you a bit. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's begin and uh, we can look at the origins of microbiology. And uh, here we see <laughs> early microbiologists. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a joke, but uh, at one time there was no knowledge whatsoever of microorganisms. If there was an epidemic, the learned doctors would say it was due to a volcano exploding somewhere or perhaps the movement of the stars. But for the common people, it was usually attributed to uh, evil spirits, uh, spells, and so on and so forth. And uh, that changed with the advent of this man. Here you see, staring across the centuries, the pleasant face of Antony van Leeuwenhoek. And from this na name, you can tell he was a Dutchman. And uh, uh, he was a, uh, not a scientist, but a fabrics merchant in the town of Delft in Holland. This was in the mid uh, 17th century, the great uh, uh, new renaissance, the end of the renaissance. And uh, he uh, was interested in the quality of fabrics. Uh, the, the Dutch made a lot of fine lace. And so he uh, started experimenting with lenses so that he could count the fibers and, and determine the quality of the product. And here's an actual uh, photograph of a Leeuwenhoek microscope. And this is what we call a simple microscope because it had uh, a single lens which was embedded in that piece of wood which was only about three inches high. And then you can see that little screw apparatus on the left uh, picture. And at the end of the pin, he would put a drop of uh, whatever it was he was looking at. And he, this man had an inexhaustible curiosity. He looked at his own blood, he looked at semen, he looked at material to scrape from his mouth. And uh, one day, uh, he looked at something, and as, uh, one historian described, it was like he opened the, the door uh, to a curiosity shop that had been closed since the beginning of time. He looked at a drop of water from a mud puddle, and in it, he saw microorganisms, first man in history to do so. So here is an illustration of Lee Van Hook looking through his microscope, and you can see that the light for the illumination was the, uh, the sun. He's looking through the window. Uh, a candle simply wasn't strong enough. And so uh, for the next 50 years, he wrote letters to the Royal Society of London describing the things that he had seen. So he saw the first protozoa and the first bacteria. Uh, <clears throat> then as we move along, we can see the evolution of medicine. And this uh, horrific uh, <laughs> photograph is a uh, painting uh, shows a uh, very common procedure, the most common uh, a surgical procedure of its time, amputation of a man's leg. And they would get these rough men off the street to hold the man down. The surgeon was trained to amputate the leg as, as, as fast as possible because this is, was the era before anesthesia. Uh, up in the left-hand corner of the spectators, you can see an African man was brought in to show them the uh, wonders of uh, uh, Western science. And you look at the horrified expression on his face. <laughs> Uh, the, surgeon, the surgeon would complete this operation uh, as fast as in 30 seconds. Take a boning knife, cut off the muscles, strip them back, cut through the, uh, the uh, bone of the saw, and then the man, no longer screaming, would be taken off to either live or die. The reason they did this was that they, uh, there were, if, if you had uh, gangrene set in on a limb, it would spread through the person's body, and they would succumb. So. Uh, it was a common surgical procedure. Now this changed gradually. In the mid uh, 19th century, we see for the first time the, uh, the uh, Hungarian physician Ignaz Semmelweis ordering his medical students to wash their hands before they delivered babies in the maternity ward. And uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, cleaning lady over there looking uh, somewhat skeptically at the doctor. And he found that soap and water wasn't sufficient. You had to use chlorinated lime. And these doctors uh, were going into the, an autopsy room where women had died in childbirth from childbed fever, uh, doing an autopsy on the patient, and then coming back and delivering babies without washing their hands. Notice that no one wears gowns. So there was no concept of the transmission of infectious diseases. And uh, even after Leeuwenhoek had seen bacteria, 
Uh, very few people were aware that such things existed. Uh, the real change came with Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was a skilled chemist. Uh, he was not a medical doctor. He was a PhD and uh, a crystallographer, but uh, uh, had, had a very brilliant mind. And he was uh, asked by a uh, 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 manufacturer of beet juice to determine why his product was contaminated and turning sour. And he also worked with uh, souring wine. And he found little globules in the sick wine and uh, uh, deduced that these were living organisms. And for a man of his intelligence, it was a simple step to conclude that if wine could uh, become uh, infected with microorganisms, so could the human body. And the putrefaction that one so commonly saw in gas gangrene was likely to be from these organisms. And then he proved that was true in a series of brilliant uh, experiments. Uh, the other towering genius of this period, they were contemporaries with Robert Koch in Germany. The, the Germans were uh, leaders in science at that time, and uh, uh, Koch was uh, working in a very isolated rural area, but worked out the life cycle of anthrax and determined it was due to spores in the soil. And, uh, uh, then went on to discover the cause of tuberculosis, which was rava va ravaging Europe at that time. Koch and Pasteur disliked each other intensely. They were both nationalists. Uh, Joseph Lister got them together at a scientific con uh, conference on one, at one point and got them to shake hands, and that was the height of their relationship. They never <laughs> collaborated. So this is Joseph Lister, <coughs> uh, who was a Scottish surgeon. Everybody has heard of Lister. He's been immortalized by Listerine. And uh, uh, here we see uh, uh, one of the great turning points in the history of microbiology. This boy had been run over by a cart and had a compound fracture. That is, the bone was protruding through the skin. Uh, in every case up to, up to now, Lister would have uh, amputated the limb because of the threat of gangrene. But he had uh, had a paper uh, given to him, written by a man named Pasteur, who suggested that there were infectious particles in the air uh, that caused gangrene. This made sense to Lister. So instead of cutting the boy's leg off, he set the bone uh, and then swabbed down the whole area with carbolic acid, a phenolic compound like Lysol. Uh, it put tin foil over it to keep it from evaporating, bandaged it up, came back the next morning uh, almost sick with anxiety, uh, took off the bandage, and to his delight, there was no sign of infection. So the rest of the, his life, this is how he, uh, uh, this is uh, what he did research on was uh, uh, sterile technique. Now the reason I'm bringing up uh, these figures is that uh, uh, some people uh, forget that Diseases everywhere, microorganisms are everywhere. I always like Lister's comment uh, to his students, you cannot see bacteria, they are invisible. You have to see them with your mind's eye. And that's good advice for everyone, especially for people that are uh, working with the general public and dealing with things like flotation tanks. And we'll come back to that more later. Uh, the last thing is uh, Paul Ehrlich, another one of the great uh, German scientists uh, who was a master of the side chain uh, uh, a theory. He came up with that hypothesis, and here he is, uh, uh, his first positive uh, work with his uh, Japanese assistant, Salversan 606, the first effective treatment for syphilis in 500 years. And so uh, this set the, uh, uh, the whole era of disinfection. It changed surgery and medical practice forever. This was around 1900. Now this is over 200 years ago, and so Microbiology is very, very well established now. Uh, now, uh, one of the uh, consequences of the discovery of microorganisms was the fact that they were uh, airborne and waterborne. And one of the big problems in the early uh, uh, development of cities was contamination of water. In England, uh, drinking water was pumped directly from the contaminated Thames River, and there was uh, continual problems with uh, 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 cholera outbreaks, and the same thing occurred in cities all over the world. So this is a famous illustration, de death at the pump. 
Um, uh, here's one of my favorites, Bellevue Hospital, uh, a, a newspaper illustrator's uh, drawing uh, from the late uh, 19th century with the rats cr cr crawling all over the patients. And uh, from what I've heard, Bellevue Hospital probably hasn't changed too much in that time. <laughs> and then Hell's Kitchen in New York City. So this is the Lower East Side. Uh, if you saw the film The Gangs of New York, they had, that was a pretty accurate de depiction of what was going on, although they didn't describe the open privies and the courtyards, uh, the smells, and the uh, infant diarrhea that swept through every summer and killed thousands upon thousands of babies. Uh, Groucho Marx grew up in this part of New York, and he said the only reason that his family didn't contract tuberculosis was that they were too poor to buy milk. And milk was one of the common vehicles of uh, tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis. Okay, so uh, things began to change uh, in the early uh, 20th century, around 1910, I would say, to be specific. Uh, and we had uh, what was uh, could, has been described as the gospel of sanitation. Uh, America was on the rise, it, the Civil War was over, it was the beginning of the construction of the great cities like New York and, and Chicago, and uh, people had become aware of the importance of sanitation, and uh, screens went up in uh, houses to keep house flies out, toilet paper made the scene for the first time, no longer the Sears catalog, and, uh, uh, and it was the beginning of the American Public Health Association, which uh, at, at that time, we were way behind uh, uh, the Europe as far as public health. And uh, Charles Dickens had written about the plight of the poor, uh, you know, 50 years before. And America was just cut, uh, catching up. And so uh, many of, the, of the, uh, uh, the establishment of many public health organizations occurred at this time. Massachusetts led with the first state uh, health department, and then everyone else followed. Now, uh, when I worked for uh, Western States Chiropractic College, now the University of Western States, uh, we, we became very heavily involved in public health. And one of the reasons is uh, uh, it's a very, uh, the, the American Public Health Association is very influential. It's the largest uh, public health association in the world now. If you go up to one of their big meetings in Washington, D.C. or New York, uh, there may be 10,000 delegates uh, show up. How would you like to organize that, Ashkan? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and when I first went, uh, chiropractic was really looked down upon, but the chiropractors did the right thing. They uh, started putting on scientific uh, presentations as a special interest group, and uh, they jumped through all the hoops. They proved that they had uh, uh, an excellent uh, educational system. It was actually dictated by the Department of Education. And uh, in 1995, uh, we achieved full section status with the American Public Health Association at the meeting in San Diego. So I was involved in that. And I've met many public health workers, and uh, I could give you a little advice in, in dealing with uh, health departments. Uh, these are all educated people. They're scientists. Uh, they're logical. They're altruistic. Most of them are very nice people. And if you are polite to them and you have a positive attitude like you've shown here this weekend, you're not going to have any trouble at all. The problems come when you look upon somebody as your enemy and, uh, you know, try to pull fast one on them or something and that never works. Now, I want to say something else about uh, uh, epidemiology. This is the science of public health and this is the keeping of statistics. Uh, this is a little rhyme uh, from uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling, who was a, uh, in his early years, a newspaper correspondent. But it very uh, neatly s sums up the attitude of the epidemiologist. Uh, you learn everything about your subject, you apply statistics, you keep records, and uh, so forth. Let's look a little bit at transmission of bacterial infections in the workplace. This is a very simple illustration called the triad of disease. And I think in the case of, of uh, pub public uh, health in, with flotation tanks, uh, we don't need to concern ourselves with a vector. That would be something like a mosquito or a tick. Let's, uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. 
And, uh, but we have an infectious agent. We have the host, which is you or your client. And we have the environmental conditions that bring them together. So they come into your establishment. And you, this, is, uh, this is a triad you don't want to see. You don't want your, your, your client to come in and then claim later that they picked up an infection when they were floating or uh, somewhere else on the premises. So we'll address that a little bit as I move along here. OK. So uh, this picture, when it came out in the 1950s, astounded everybody. It was one of the first pictures taken with a strobe flash. And it shows droplet nuclei. They become lighter, and they float into the air. So if I were to sneeze, uh, and didn't cover in my mouth, uh, the, the particles could float from me all the way to the back row of this auditorium. They can, studies have shown they can float about 30 meters before they land. And this is why uh, closed places like uh, uh, classrooms uh, are good, good places to spread disease in wintertime when there's flu and, and colds going around. And uh, also uh, gives you some idea of uh, transmission uh, elsewhere in the workplace, as many possibilities. Now, uh, let's look at the structure of the skin, which I think uh, should be of uh, interest to you. We've already talked about the absorption of, uh, of uh, magnesium sulfate through the skin. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of that just because I haven't seen uh, any uh, really conclusive studies. Uh, one thing I can say about the skin is if you look at that top layer, uh, that is the stratum corneum, otherwise known as the horny layer of the skin. And that is a, a very tightly knit uh, layer of cells, and the upper layer of it are dead cells, completely dead. And the uh, living epidermal cells are underneath that, and they're continually moving up, and then when they get to the surface and are exposed to the air, they die. And uh, this, uh, there's also lipids there which keep this uh, uh, layer kind of uh, flexible and impervious to water. So if you uh, have someone that uh, is, uh, uh, is floating, and it, whether it's in, a, in one of your tanks or in a swimming pool, they're not going to become waterlogged from, for, from floating for long periods of time because you've got a pretty impervious uh, layer here. Now, some things will move through, the, through that layer fairly easily. You know, if we had a skin like an elephant, nothing would get through it. But you would lose a lot of your flexibility. And uh, there's continually, uh, continually uh, uh, sloughing off of those outer cells. So when someone is in the uh, flotation tank, they're going to be losing cells in that tank. Now, there's something else about the skin, and that's the normal bacterial flora. And there's actually been uh, 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 studies done on the ecology of the skin, and it, it varies a lot. The, the palms of your hand are like the arid wastes of the desert compared to the uh, rainforest of the armpits or the groin. And uh, so you're going to get huge amounts of bacteria in the armpits, but not on the hands and so forth. And these bacteria are continually sloughing off. So you take a shower before you go into your flotation tank uh, wash off all the bacteria. Uh, how long is it before they, they regain their normal numbers after a shower? About 15 minutes. You'll have as many bacteria as before the shower. What do deodorant soaps do? Like Life Boy or Irish Spring and that sort of stuff. Well, we've got a chemical in there that will convert the bacteria in your armpit from gram positive to gram negative. There's as, just as many bacteria there, but they don't produce this, the same malodorous end product. Uh, so one of the common organisms that lives on the surface of the skin is Staphylococcus aureus. Now this is not always a pathogenic organism. It doesn't always cause infection. But there are some strains that do cause infection. And they, uh, let's see, they uh, it can be transmitted to persons that uh, are vulnerable. So uh, here's some of the Staphylococcal skin infection. And suppose this person, you know, you're dealing with the general public, suppose they show up for their float and they, they have this appearance. So what do you do? Turn them away? There's a good question. Um, come back when this is over. Or maybe it's just a little one. It's barely, you can barely see it. 
So you say, okay, here, take, some, take this bottle of Vaseline, put some Vaseline on there, and that'll keep it from stinging when you're in the tub, because those salts are gonna sting it. So they, they rub the Vaseline on, they put a little bit more on, they give you back the container, they go in the tub. The next person that comes in uses the Vaseline, puts it on their fingers where they've got a low abrasion, and the next thing they've got a staph infection was transmitted from the Vaseline. So this is what I mean by being aware. I mean, there's more ways to be aware than just laying in a hot tub. So uh, uh, you have to see these things with your mind's eye and kind of make decisions. Uh, here's another uh, uh, condition that's very common, the commonest uh, skin condition probably in the United States, maybe about 1 to 2 percent of the public has it, psoriasis. Psoriasis is uh, a classic scaling disorder. They have silvery scales, and sometimes there's, uh, it, it comes and goes. Sometimes there's uh, inflammation, even skin cracking. And uh, one thing about psoriasis patients is that they're always looking around for something to help their condition. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if people with psoriasis showed up and want to see if magnesium sulfate will, will uh, uh, help them improve. Now, they're not going to transmit any bacteria from their condition, but there will be a lot of cells sloughing off into the water. And we'll come to what to do about that in a minute. Now, there's one other thing that I, uh, about showering, and that is, uh, uh, I, I read, uh, in, in reading up on this, uh, these issues, I saw that uh, uh, surgeons who are going to do some kind of delicate surgery that used to take showers before they would gown up, but they don't do that anymore because they showed that they, uh, the shower loosens off rafts of bacteria that are then easily shed uh, into the environment where the surgeon's working. So that's a, an issue also. So what do we do about these things? Now, a water filter uh, will remove epithelial uh, organic material, including epithelial cells. And the organic material might include um, skin lotions and things like that. And uh, so that's one, uh, that's one thing that can be done. Uh, another thing that I wanted to comment on is that uh, uh, inside of your, your hot or your, uh, excuse me, your uh, float tank, you have the, the ceiling and you have, may have some seams in there. And uh, someone told me that there's a heater that kind of keeps the uh, moisture from accumulating. But even if you get a little bit of moisture, it's very common to have biofilm start to form. If you've uh, ever let your toilet go for a few days without cleaning it and you see a kind of a yellow uh, scum on the surface, those are iron bacteria. They get their energy from iron in the water. And uh, then they, they produce a kind of a slimy uh, uh, coat, and that will accumulate uh, uh, other organisms, and it gets thicker and thicker, and it may be a problem in industry. So uh, that's something else to consider. Notice that this, uh, if you can read that there, this uh, slide is from the Center for Biofilm Engineering at, M, uh, at uh, Montana State University in Bozeman. So if you want to uh, check that site, they'll give you all kinds of information on biofilms and their formation. So uh, my advice is that when you're doing your routine cleaning of your, of your uh, tanks, uh, to make sure that you use some good, uh, uh, just household cleaner. I, I, I kind of like crud cleaner. It's a, it, it has a citrus base, and it's biodegradable, uh, not harmful and uh, just clean the, uh, all of the surfaces routinely and then make a record of it and you won't have any problem. Now, uh, what about halophilic bacteria? Halophilic bacteria mean uh, those bacteria that are salt lovers, literally, salt-loving bacteria. Uh, the Dead Sea isn't exactly dead, nor is the Great Salt Lake. There are halophilic bacteria that live in there that have uh, adapted to life in an extremely salty environment. So here you see someone floating. Uh, you wouldn't see this in one of your tanks because there's no light, but uh, otherwise it's about the same thing. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the Dead Sea, by the way, uh, they have a big spa business of people that are being treated for psoriasis because the combination of soaking in the, in the salty water and exposure to extreme uh, 
Uh, sunlight uh, helps psoriasis go into a, a remission sometimes for as long as six months. So what's the probability of having halophilic bacteria develop in your float tank? I think it's very slight, especially the way these tanks are uh, maintained, and we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, this just shows uh, some of the adaptive changes uh, in proteins. You can see on the uh, right there, the halophilic uh, bacteria have entirely different uh, surface protein structure uh, than, uh, on the, uh, than the ones on the left, which are normal bacteria. And uh, there is uh, osmosis going on here. Uh, these halophilic bacteria actually have to have a salt, high salt content to uh, live. But normal bacteria, if they're put in a salt environment, uh, osmosis will just suck the protoplasm right out of the cell. So what is osmosis? <laughs> this is an example that anyone can understand. You go from an area of greater concentration to lesser concentration through a membrane. So when bacteria from your client's body uh, go into the into the uh, uh, Epsom salt solution, uh, they're going to be immediately killed by osmosis. Now, in addition to that, we have another adjunct, and that is ultraviolet light. And uh, ultraviolet light is used in combination with hydrogen peroxide. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, what does ultraviolet light do? Uh, ultraviolet light actually damages uh, and actually destroys DNA. So you can see the UV light coming in from the, uh, the upper left there, and the consequence afterwards is the broken chromosomes. Uh, this is also the uh, etiology of skin cancer. If you're overexposed to ultraviolet light, you will develop cancers because of this very thing. And uh, it's also uh, uh, bacteria are susceptible, but not equally susceptible. Uh, the most susceptible bacteria would be the ones that live in your intestinal tract and are never exposed to the light of day. The ones that are resistant are bacteria that live out in the sunlight. And then we come to hydrogen peroxide. You see this is a very simple molecule uh, related to water, except that it has uh, uh, an extra oxygen. And when that's broken off, it, it, it's a reactive oxygen. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is a very interesting uh, chemical. Uh, it's been around since early in the, in the probably uh, 20th century. And uh, its first, uh, the first use of, use of hydrogen peroxide was to bleach straw hats, which were very popular at that time. And then as time went uh, on, there were many other uh, uses. So we see the cellular effect of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, it oxidizes the cell. Uh, down here is the, uh, it, it, it stops the uh, TCA cycle, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, and uh, it stops amino acid biosynthesis, and in short, the cells die very quickly. Hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, exists and uh, is sold in different concentrations. We have less than uh, eight concentration. You know, if you go in the grocery store, you can get 3% hydrogen peroxide. It's an excellent disinfection, disinfectant. Uh, it's sometimes recommended for people that are having a, a periodontal uh, surgery recovery because it keeps the bacteria from growing in the, in the surgical areas in their mouth. Uh, it's hydrogen peroxide put in toothpaste sometimes as a, as a tooth whitener. Uh, and then at higher concentrations, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the health hazards start to increase. And uh, when you get 20 to 52, they, the health hazards are about three and remain at that point. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is uh, very caustic at, at high concentrations, and I understand that uh, you use it in a tank uh, disinfection at about 35%, uh, percent, which is very high. Uh, one thing I can say as far as the microbial aspects of uh, of uh, hydrogen peroxide is that it, it's one of the few chemicals that will uh, reliably kill bacterial spores. Bacterial spores are extremely resistant, uh, but, and there's only a few chemicals like um, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, um, iodine very weakly, but hydro hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has been used for decades to sterilize 
dialysis units and heart-lung machines. Uh, the only uh, downside of that is it's uh, corrosive to metals and even plastic uh, with a long exposure. So they always have to do surveillance to make sure uh, those parts aren't being damaged. Let's see. Um, in really high concentrations, uh, hydrogen peroxide has been used as a rocket propellant. Uh, the Russians still use it as a pro propellant for submarines. Uh, but uh, it can be explosive in those con uh, high concentrations. Now, importance of record keeping, uh, I, I really, I was going to comment on this, but after, uh, uh, it, uh, Gar uh, Graham's uh, talk, I, I really was kind of blown away by that. Uh, you know, in, uh, in my business, uh, we keep meticulous records. We have to have a log for the autoclave and a log for the, uh, for the incubator for the bacteria. We have to record all of the, the dates, explore, exploration dates of our media. And you know, these uh, temperature logs have to be done every day, uh, dated, initialed. And, uh, uh, and then when the inspectors from the state come in, they go over that with a fine tooth comb. Uh, so, uh, my advice in, in a situation like yours is to, is to uh, keep these records. Uh, the DEQ likes to have their rec records kept in a loose leaf notebook. So when you come in, they just hand them the notebook and here it is and they can flip through the pages and see that you've done everything properly. Uh, if, you, if you don't keep the records properly and you fake it, uh, that's what we call in my business dry labbing. And uh, that's a bad thing and ultimately will backfire on you. So uh, it's re the record keeping and, and communication is really important. And uh, I think uh, having an organization like this and a conference like this is uh, the best thing you can do uh, to improve the status of your, uh, uh, your business and uh, organization. Uh, really one last thing, uh, here's uh, uh, this uh, quotation by Moshe Feldenkrais. I always admired Moshe Feldenkrais's work. He was the originator of uh, 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 somatic uh, body rem remodeling, uh, and uh, he, he was a judo practitioner. I also practiced and coached judo for many years, and he was a soccer player, and I also did that. So uh, uh, I think this is, is a good uh, way to end my talk, and I'll open it up for any questions, and uh, if I can answer the question, maybe somebody in the audience can. Okay, how's our time going? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, does anybody have a question? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, do you know anything about uh, how different chemicals might react differently in the water? For instance, um, how uh, like uh, hydrogen peroxide might act differently uh, in this high concentration of salt, like 25% magnesium sulfate, as opposed to acid. Yeah. So, well, um, how are these chemicals possibly different in the high salt setting, specifically bromine and chlorine and hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, I, I have a um, uh, an article here that I got online. Hydrogen peroxide is a disinfectant, and I have their website if anyone was interested. It's called, uh, and uh, they uh, mention here, without going into a lot of detail, that th there are many. Uh, permutations, uh, you can uh, change the pH and that will change the properties of hydrogen peroxide. One thing that's commonly done in uh, hospitals is to mix hydrogen peroxide with uh, uh, parasitic acid and parasitic acid is simply adding acetic acid to hydrogen peroxide and then you mix the two together and that's what's actually used in the uh, uh, disinfection of uh, dialysis units. Um, uh, but uh, it would depend upon the situation, but that certainly is manipulated. What is the website? Um, it's um, www.lentech.com, L-E-N-N-T-E-C-H.
And it's, uh, it's quite interesting. It, it's, uh, the characteristics of hydrogen peroxide, the corrosiveness, the destruction, how is it produced, how is it transported and stored, applications. Uh, how does disinfection work? Drinking water disinfection, swimming pool disinfection, cooling towers. Does hydrogen peroxide remove chlorine? And, it, and the answer is yes, it can be used for dechlorination and so forth. That's a good. And what about, um, what about the actual testing of, of these different things? Like if you're testing for hydrogen peroxide, um, uh, can we rely on the sort of testing equipment that's made for regular water in such a crazy solution? Uh, I think for the, the answer to that, you have to go to uh, some of these sites that give information on uh, testing for swimming pools. Uh, and, okay, there was uh, uh, probably many of you are familiar with the site called askallen.com. And uh, he's, a, he's a swimming pool guru, but also a answers questions on uh, flotation tanks. And you could write to him and ask him some of these things. But I'm not really in the business of, of doing this kind of testing. You want an E. coli, I'll give you E. coli. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think of ozone as a sterilization? Uh, ozone has, been, has replaced chlorination in many places. I think Los Angeles uses it now. Um, uh, sterilization and disinfection are two different terms. Disinfection means destruction of the, the most pathogenic organism. Sterilization is an absolute term. And generally, we only use sterilization in the case where there's absolutely no microorganism detected. So an autoclave or hydrogen peroxide would result in sterilization. Ozone, probably not. And then do you um, have a, the one thing that's thrown out about ozone um, with float tanks is the fact that it's an enclosed chamber. Um, any thoughts on like uh, ozone gas being created and potential problems with the enclosed aspects of float tanks? Uh, I've heard ozone and, and bromine, I, would, I don't know from personal experience, but have a slight odor. Uh, I was telling someone uh, earlier that um, I, I, I'm at, I go to a gym where there's a spa, and they have, uh, uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, earlier in the talk, but uh, uh, I was talking to the manager about how they, they treat the water in their, in their hot tub. And he said they have a device, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was, uh, they, they put salt water in their tub, and this device breaks the sodium chloride down into sodium and chloride, and the chloride then acts as a disinfectant, but you don't get chloramines produced, so there's no odor. And before they did that, they had all these complaints uh, from the clients about the smell of chlorine. And you can't, even, you can't detect it at all anymore. You were back there. Uh, well, uh, uh, like some bacteria are halophilic, there's other bacteria that are uh, acidophilic. And the most acidoph acidophilic uh, organisms are fungi. So if there's an acid environment, you often will get fungus growing. What about if it's extremely acid, like 2.5? Uh, that's, uh, you're not gonna get, most bacteria wouldn't grow on that. You might get bacteria in a, in a bog and that's kind of like the Dead Sea, where you have a really extreme environment and organisms have evolved to live in that environment, but you're not gonna get those in a flotation center. But if there's a solution that's 2.5, would that be enough to um, kill the bacteria then? I would think so. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think from, from what I know about flotation tanks, the, the, the high salt concentration and then the it's really overkill with this uh, UV light and uh, uh, filtration and uh, hydrogen peroxide that there's, it's really a very sanitary setup. However, in reading the, uh, through Ask Allen's advice to clients, uh, there were some situations where someone said, well, my, my flotation tank, I've been using it for a couple of years now and it's starting to smell bad. And that means, uh, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Something's growing in there. 
Benjamin? Uh, can you talk about this formation of the biofilm? Yes. Is something probably um, genetic or something just above the waterline because the water rises when the person gets inside the water? You could get the biofilm just above the waterline. Uh, or you could get it higher than that. If there's any moisture at all, uh, they, they will move into it. So, but um, the, the biofilm, it, it exists above the water line. How do you want to get rid of it? Well, you just have to go in and, and clean it physically and do it periodically because it'll always come back. That's, you know, we, 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 what we see commonly in my lab, because uh, they do a lot of drinking water, is this will show up in somebody's well water. So what do you, what do, you do? If you've got iron bacteria in your well water, your, your water starts to have a metallic taste. Well, we advise them to take a gallon of bleach, pour it in the well, leave it overnight, run the water the next day until there's absolutely no odor of bleach, and then your problem's gone until the next time. And usually we see iron bacteria about this time of year because it's the warmest time of the year and they've had a chance to grow all summer. But all of these wells along the Columbia River are full of iron bacteria. I've done, we've done many tests of, on them over the years. Yes? Would the biofilm be on the bottom of the tank? Uh, the that's uh, unlikely the that there would be a biofilm on the bottom of the tank because of the uh, uh, that's where you have the high concentration of, uh, of Epsom salts. But it's going to be above that level where you don't get the salts. Yes? Um, I read that uh, UV hydroperoxide combination with UV um, somehow activates the hydroperoxide molecules to be more effective. Is there like that? Uh, I don't remember reading that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide easily breaks apart. And uh, uh, so uh, UV light might have an effect on it. I really don't know. I wanted to say something, too, about the absorption through the skin. I, I remember uh, this is a kind of a funny story. Uh, there's a uh, uh, kind of a folk tale in Denmark that if you stick your feet in a bucket of vodka, you will get drunk. <laughs> And a couple of graduate students in Copenhagen actually did a test where they, they did that. They stuck their feet in a tub full of vodka for uh, an hour or an hour and a half. And then they, they drew their blood and looked for blood alcohol and there wasn't any. So a waste of vodka. <laughs> 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 or maybe not. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, if it got into the tank, no problem because the, the bacteria wouldn't, you know, this guy could go in the tank without putting any Vaseline on the, on the skin and the bacteria would be killed. It would probably sting like heck though. Yeah, up here. Well, I, I think uh, these uh, citrus, she's asking about cleaning the floors and the bathrooms, and that's a good point. I was going to mention that, and that's why I had that sign about wash your hands. Uh, I think uh, in, the, in your business, you want to keep the place just sparkling clean and probably clean it every, every morning, uh, first person that's there, and maybe even more than once a day, make sure that, that the bathrooms are clean, the floors are clean. And I really like these citrus based cleaners because they're biodegradable, uh, they don't have much of an odor, it's kind of an orange peel odor, and they're very effective. And uh, that's all you need to do, but somebody has to do it. And there are a lot of people that don't like to clean toilets, can you believe that? <laughs> the, the brand of cleaner, what would you say? Other brands of cleaners? I don't know, Simple Green you know, works. And... Pardon me? I like Crud Cleaner. It's a very powerful one. Crud, crud Cleaner? Crud Cleaner. You can get it at, uh, at uh, Home Depot. Concentrate. But there's others. It doesn't matter. You just, just use it. <laughs> yes? Have you heard about a UVC light? Uh, a wand? A wand? A wand is uh, supposed to, it's UVC. And it's supposed to penetrate pretty much everything. Um, well, I went to space time in Chicago. It 
will burn you? Well, it's short wave UV light then. It's some form of short wave UV light if it'll burn you. No. No, you need to scrub it off. It's, it's more tenacious than that. Uh, if, if, you know, the other thing with these filters, they've, they've been talking about cha routinely, routinely changing the filters. And uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you don't do that, the organisms will actually multiply on the surface of the filter, and the biofilm will form on the surface of the filter, and it no longer works. And I've done analysis of a number of filters over the years. People say, my, what's, what's wrong with my filter? You need a new one. <laughs> That's all there is to it. It's covered with biofilm. Yes? Um, yeah, sorry. What are your thoughts or comments on the potentially nefarious health effects of chloramines? How do you what? Uh, uh, chloramines, like the compounds that are sort of the, that result in the use of uh, chlorine? Or Bleach? Chlorine, chlorine producing chloramines and the potential uh, negative health effects of that? Well, uh, chlorine fumes are, uh, are toxic, yeah. and it's toxic to the skin, it's toxic to the internal organs. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any reason for using bleach uh, uh, under normal conditions if, th if things are, are, are clean. You'd, you'd be better off using hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. We, we hear about the, the you know, chlorine gas being... Yeah, uh, bleach, bleach is uh, cheap and it's very effective, but, you know, it just smells bad. Yeah. And it's very pervasive. You get it on your skin, it'll smell like bleach. And just chlorine in general, like the use of chlorine in yeah. even a pool, does that result in toxicity? Uh, toxicity of chlorine in the pool? Well, you know, I don't know that much about the research, but there's been uh, uh, a big trend to move away from chlorination of water, like ozonation. Uh, just because of the, of the uh, potential health hazards. Um, and we have actually a kind of interesting tidbit to add ourselves about um, a stress test that we just got done at a water uh, testing lab with some of the water from our tank. Yeah, so um, a couple things. The first one I wanted to say was the um, wiping down the inside of the tanks. Um, when we were in Sweden, we had um, another um, water uh, health expert come up, and um, the... Uh, there we go. Oh, hey, guys. Um, so we had uh, when we were in Sweden, we talked. Uh, we had another um, uh, speaker who was a uh, yeah water um, water expert, and what he said was yeah the inside the tank the water um, very hard to um, um, have organisms multiply, especially within that. Um, and for wiping down the inside of the tanks, um, he recommended two to three times a week at least for um, getting inside there and actually wiping down the uh, walls, uh, simply because that's one of the areas, especially with so much humidity and moisture in there where bacteria can actually grow and where the salt's not going to get. And then the main thing I wanted to say was um, we've been doing water tests um, every two weeks and submitting them for um, lab tests for staph and for E. coli and for Pseudomonas. Um, which have all come back uh, consistently negative every single time um, to the below the lowest pos possible detection threshold. And then I found out about something called a challenge study, which uh, maybe some of you know about, but if you don't, then um, this is something that'll really help you with the health department, which is um, if you ask for a challenge study from your local testing place, they will actually inject whatever bacteria you want into your solution and then monitor over the course of, in our case, four hours, um, how that drops with your water level and with your disinfection. Um, so, uh, just, you know, even though we were coming back negative, we're like, okay, well, maybe that just means we don't have that much bacteria around. So um, the minimum detection threshold was less than 10, less than 2, and less than 2 parts per million, I believe. I can't remember which those applied to um, off the top of my head. Um, and so they injected around 20,000 um, parts per million of each of the different um, three types of bacteria that we were interested in testing. And um, like I said, it's over a four-hour period, and um, we disinfect with straight hydrogen peroxide, um, no UV. And um, the, when they took the test at the first half an hour, um, for the water, all of the levels were below the um, minimum possible detection threshold. So within half an hour um, of injecting this huge amount of bacteria into the water, um, it had gone down to below the, um, the detectable threshold. Um, we have all of the documentation, which we can send along to anyone who's interested. Um, but mainly, especially just with your own tanks, um, getting documentation in a challenge study um, is something we just discovered that ends up being hugely helpful. I think... enzymes and how to control them to not be dangerous for the skin? Uh, enzymes in what context? Uh, 
in the biofilm. Uh, biofilm is not going to have pathogenic organisms, at least initially. I think if you keep, keep the place clean, it won't be any problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, enzymes are enzymes are proteins, and proteins are easily denatured with uh, with uh, soap and certainly hydrogen peroxide. They wouldn't last a second. Yeah. So you would not even recommend using red. It's not necessary. No, it's not necessary. I wanted to say one one other thing. When when Ash Khan called me up, he and I went down to the float center and uh, talked to him, and then he invited me to come back and and take a float, and I did, and it's been kind of on my bucket list, and uh, I had no uh, problem at all with, uh, with going in the tank. I thought it was, uh, their, their system is quite sanitary, and it was amazing. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Fred.